Good afternoon and welcome to Van Andel Institute's public lecture series, Biobanks, the Science of Samples. I'm Miranda, I am thrilled you are here today to learn more about biobanking. Now the discoveries we hear about from research don't just come out of thin air. Scientists work tirelessly to make life-changing breakthroughs and this work is often fueled by biological samples crucial specimens donated by volunteers that allow scientists to investigate how our bodies work. The samples provide unique insights. How does your body operate when it's healthy? How and why does it change when you're sick? The answers to those questions lie within these critical samples, helping us understand how we can better prevent, predict, diagnose, and treat diseases like cancer, Parkinson's, and many others. And that's why it's important to treat these samples with the utmost care and consistency. And believe me, that is no easy task. It requires planning, thoughtfulness, and specialized facilities called biobanks. And would you believe it, that a biobank is right here in Grand Rapids. Lucky for us, today we are joined by a nationally recognized expert in biobanking, Dr. Scott Jewell. He is a professor in the Department of Cell Biology and the director of VAI's Pathology and Biorespiratory Care Corps. He oversees the Institute's contributions to many large-scale collaborative projects designed to shed new light onto cancer, Parkinson's rare disorders, and many others. Now, after Dr. Jewell's presentation, we're gonna have a time for questions and answers. If you find yourself with a question during the presentation, please submit it via the chat function, or you can hold them and submit them once we begin questions and answers. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott Jewell. Hello. Hi, Miranda. Uh, thank you for that introduction. It's very kind. I'm excited to be here to present uh, the topic of biobanks, the science of samples. And before we get on to a presentation video, I would like to first just say that uh, this on the surface, biobanking is a very, seems conceptual, very simple and easy. Uh, almost anyone can do it is what most people think. And, in fr and frankly, you, you actually do this at home. Uh, your refrigerator freezers, your, your pantries, where they have stored uh, dry goods, all basically are kind of like a biobank. And a biobank is often considered to be a library of specimens. Uh, but there is a lot of nuances to biobanking that uh, are very, very important, especially in large scientific studies. And so I want to show a video uh, here that was made by our communications team of our biobanks at, at Van Andel. Uh, and it will present some of the, give you a visual feature look of what we have in our biobanks, as well as some of the technologies that we use. But prior to doing, showing that video, I do want to take a moment to thank all of the staff that I have without the experts that we have in our laboratories and our experts for uh, project management, and certainly the larger group of operations at the Van Andel Research Institute. Uh, we could not do this work. Uh, we serve uh, nationally many projects. And without this great team, it just wouldn't come to, to fruition. So uh, we can move now to the video and I'd love to talk to you after that video. Thank you. Um, the biobanks, the science of samples, I'm 
hoping to present uh, a concept of what we do here. It won't be everything, but it'll be uh, hopefully helpful to you. Uh, what I want to talk about is the, the topics for biobanking is what is biobanking? Uh, how is biobanking for medical med biomedical research? It can be done by for plants and animals, but we're going to talk more specifically about biomedical research. Why is biobanking important? How is biobanking accomplished? Some examples of biobanks and their impacts on healthcare. Uh, biobanks that are developed or managed here at the Van Andel Institute, and how can people get involved in biobanking? So first, let me just mention that biobanking is a collection of, uh, in this case, human specimens or samples. Um, it is used for uh, obviously downstream research or research at the time to answer critical questions. But it's important that we have a standardized processing methods, standardized storage methods, and a lot of management and quality control over what we do. Uh, the types of samples that we would work with could be either fixed, we call them fixed either as a frozen sample, or they may be chemically fixed using things like aldehydes. Uh, formaldehyde is, a, is, a, is an option of one of those alcohols, acids, and bases. So chemistry, knowing the chemistry behind what it does in tissues and how it may affect the tissue itself or the, or the cells or the, or the fluids is important uh, in, in biobanking. I thought it might be interesting just to remind everyone that our body is really made up a lot of water. Uh, and if you look at most tissues in the body, uh, they are also made up of obviously different percentages of water. And we take that into account when we're thinking about what's happening to tissues or cells or fluids when they are either fixed or frozen, especially like in the frozen state. And the sample types that we may use are things like tissue, blood, serum, and plasma, which is a part of your peripheral blood serum and so forth, uh, white blood cells. You can also use urine, saliva, uh, stools, buccal cells, a number of different cell populations or fluids throughout the body can serve as important uh, samples or specimens uh, for us to study. What you may not know is if you haven't studied the metric system too much is exactly, you know, what does it mean to store a sample at uh, ambient temperature or room temperature? Well, that would be, for example, something that we might do for a, for a fixed sample that's in wax, uh, paraffin, but we don't want to keep it frozen so it stays at ambient temperature or 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. But when you get down to the frozen temperatures, a mechanical minus 20 freezer, is uh, basically what you would have in your home at minus four degrees Fahrenheit or minus 20 degrees centigrade. And then there's, uh, as you get colder, we actually always stay in the, in the Celsius range. Minus 80 degree freezers are actually minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit and liquid nitrogen freezers are in the minus 300 degree temperatures. You could go to try and go to absolute zero, that's Kelvin zero, but that's actually impossible. So uh, being at the liquid nitrogen level almost suspends all molecular movement. And it's that molecular movement in tissues and samples that where proteins interact and function uh, where they are active the warmer they get. So when they're really held suspended in a very cold temperature, uh, they are held stable. And that's what we're trying to accomplish in a biobank. You know, some of the big concepts of biobanking is that there's always proper staff training. Uh, so people have to understand how it is to work in a biological laboratory, uh, understanding all the risks that are involved in it. Uh, how do you label specimens appropriately and track them appropriately? So there's a sophisticated softwares and databases. Uh, we use class two biological safety hoods to protect our staff from any infectious issues, although those are rare in any of the samples we handle. Uh, and of course, we have appropriate soft, uh, safety of the storage specimens that actually protect the specimens themselves from things like power outages and or loss of, uh, of, of liquid nitrogen and so forth. Uh, we have a lot of uh, expertise in packaging samples or providing specimen kits to investigators so they can collect samples properly. Of course, disposing of samples is important and, and having all of the elements that are around the protective equipment uh, to use the samples is part of the biobanking uh, concept. Biomedical, uh, biobanking for biomedical research starts with the informed consent process of an individual, a patient, a participant, um, and I, I call it informed consent because that's exactly what it's meant to be, not just a consent, but an informed consent, where you are actually told about what's going on in the research, we give you a better understanding of how it's going to happen, and then you consent that process to providing samples for the research. 
So sample collection occurs, uh, samples are then processed, uh, and then they are moved into the storage area. And then of course they get distributed or used to in by investigators based on the research project itself. So examples on, this, on the side here is that, uh, again, you can think of a biobank as a library and it can be anywhere from small numbers of freezers to warehouses of freezers. Uh, I've known some, some uh, biobank facilities that have as many as 20 or 30 million samples or even more in their biobank. So it all starts with the Institutional Review Board where you are consented. And I wanted to bring this up because I wanted to also talk about uh, the appropriateness of collecting samples from individuals for research. It always involves a process of an Institutional Review Board looking over the protocol or the process of which a scientist is wanting to do. So looking at that research, making sure the research is, is sound, um, making sure that their collection of the samples from the individuals or the patients are, are not in excess. Uh, and that are used appropriately or managed appropriately. And one of the big elements around that is data security, uh, uh, protecting the identity of the individual, making sure that that information that is passed down the line and the use of those samples is always uh, appropriate. So that's one of the really important elements of biobanking and, and the scientific research, especially clinical research, is the Institutional Review Board. So biobanking generally is working in two areas of research. One would be the clinical translational research area, which may involves new drug development and testing, uh, and also diagnostic and standard of care treatment, which is happening through your clinical trials. If you're to look at a uh, process of what clinical trials are, just to help you with that concept, uh, there are actually preclinical uh, components of a clinical trial. And this will be using animal models in many cases to mimic a disease, of which samples are collected and used for that research. Uh, and then of course it goes through phase zero, which is really just looking at the pharmacokinetics of a drug. Uh, phase one, which is really trying to determine the safety, the dosage of the safety of the, of the drug to be administered. Phase two is really the efficacy. Uh, so it's looking at both safety at the point of how it may actually create an effect of what you want that drug to do. Is it really treating the disease? Is it really making a, a, have an effect? And of course, phase three is looking at how that affects uh, thousands of individuals, up to 3,000 patients, for example. Mm -hmm. And then the long-term analysis in phase in clinical trials is really the ongoing review of patients who have received the drug. So if you can think about it, when you get something as large as a phase three trial, and you've got 3,000 patients involved, and you're trying to collect blood and serum or, or tissues, you can't individually test every sample by itself. That, that would not be proper or appropriate in a scientific study. So these would need to be batched together and then tested uh, as time goes on. So biobanking becomes critically important to make sure that those samples represent the disease in the most basic way possible so that we don't introduce other changes and other variables into that sample that otherwise are not part of the disease. Uh, so again, that is a very hard, uh, a typical component of biomedical biobanking and certainly once in clinical trials. Of course, there's also the basic research side of, of biobanking, and that's where you're really trying to make discoveries about new pathways in disease or new elements that would help to determine whether there's therapeutic value in going down that pathway. Uh, so if you just look at something like cardiovascular disease, you can see that there are many areas, many pathways in cardiovascular disease where individual scientists might want to study something like angiogenesis or DNA methylation or hypoxia signaling uh, and, or things like that. And so when you're looking at those individual pathways, which many of them have hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of different components to them, uh, you, you really need samples, that enough samples that can help you to verify the findings that you have. And it's obviously challenging uh, in many cases to do this when you're only collecting one or two or three samples at a time. So why is biobanking important? Well, it collects a large number of specimens over a period of time from a large set of people with the same disease to test scientific questions. So that's the basis of a lot of our trials. It also though allows, once those are collected, correlative science to take place. And that what that means is that you may have had an initial question that you were trying to ask in that study, but all of a sudden you found in that study some other intriguing questions that you wanna verify or look into. And so those samples can serve again investigators to look down to, to discover more information in the disease that maybe hadn't originally been planned or anticipated. 
uh, biobanking provides subsets of samples that a research investigator can go and do. So if they're already there as an archive, as a library, uh, they can actually come up with a question that may be unrelated to the initial collection of those samples and accelerate the research. All these samples are available and accelerate it very, very quickly. Uh, it's an archive, as I've mentioned, that's a library. So providing retrospective samples that can be used to test new technologies or new methods is important. And we've had a large number of new omic technologies come about in the last 10 years, of which many of these samples can be used again and again to verify and or to confirm how well those methodologies work. So also, may, these samples may actually uh, be available at some periods of time, but not available later. And what I mean by that is that if we've collected samples back in the 1980s or 1990s, many of the surgeries done then, for example, on cancers may have been large resections. And so you get a lot of tissue from those. But as, as techniques move, as new uh, availabilities become medicine, you may end up with much, much smaller amounts of those samples taken in order to actually uh, do the treatment and or the surgeries or the samples may get cut up significantly so that you can't see a whole tissue in its back. So collecting samples over time helps to give you a perspective of the types of material that were available both in the past, but it's also how much you have to deal with in the future. So right now, for example, we have to use smaller and smaller amounts of sample in order to be able to get the same, if not larger amounts of data from those samples. I wanted to take the opportunity just to show you again some of the complexity of what happens in biology. Uh, of course, we're interested in the DNA and RNA, and these are on the left, you can see is a, a, a cartoon of a DNA strand or DNA molecule. And on the right, uh, in the lower right-hand corner, is a cartoon of the proteins being produced from the DNA that's transcribed by the RNA and then, of course, uh, translated into protein. And if you just think about this as the fundamental process of all cell biology, uh, that's the, those are the areas that are being looked at and discovered, and we want to maintain each of those components. DNA is really stable. RNA is very fragile. Uh, and proteins have their own interesting uh, functionality and ability as well. Uh, so they may not change as much, but they can be fractured and freeze thawing. Uh, they can go through changes if water's dehydrated quite a bit from them. So there's a lot of things that uh, are, are, are processes that happen when these samples are preserved over time. And we have to look at both what it looked like at the beginning, call it, control it, and also understand how old the samples might be. So are they really representing the same material that when they first were collected? If you took a cell and you cut it in two, you would see a lot of the organelles that are there. Uh, so every component or organelle of a cell, uh, as you can see here, nucleus, nucleolus, ribosome, vesicles, et cetera, are very unique and specific of, cell, of, of proteins uh, that help to make up those elements and also the function that happens in those organelles. So we're really trying to think about biology here when we're working with biosamples. And that's important. While there may not be a lot of variations on how we handle them, we certainly do look at quality control measures, such as is the DNA, is the DNA, does it have high integrity? Is it high of high integrity of the RNA? And what does integrity mean, for example? Uh, so those are elements that we really work with. And having the knowledge about the cell biology helps us to understand maybe even new methods that we can use to work with those cells. If I extended this to say the hallmarks of cancer are on the left-hand side, as you can see, there's numbers of elements or, or, or pathways so there are hallmarks of cancer. Um, so epigenetic plasticity, um, avoiding immune destruction. Uh, and if you took that over to what is avoiding immune destruction, you might be thinking about the T cell receptor signaling. And this is just a cartoon to show you all the different chemical processes that are going on uh, that we know about in T cell receptor. Uh, management in terms of signaling. It's not even the T cell in terms of other activities, but in terms of signaling. So each of these areas and pathways are the things that scientists study and have to learn, uh, you know, how is it being affected? So whether you were in an animal model or in human tissue, we want to make sure that it's representing that process as, as well as possible. Examples of biobanks and their impact on healthcare is really important to understand, or at least to have a, a awareness of. And this is where you as a public uh, should be interested in because it tells you whether these are really worthwhile ventures. Um, the one on the left is the Framingham Heart Study. And I think it started in 1946. It's actually now out three generations of healthcare research. 
Uh, it was only intended to go for a few years, but as it got more and more prominence and found more and more new things, they continued it and it still continues today. And it has provided a tremendous amount of information on cardiovascular health. So the study itself is important, but they've had to collect data, a lot of health data and samples to, be, to really understand and study those questions, scientific questions over time. The UK Biobank represented by the cartoon on the right is also a very large study The 500,000 uh, people in the UK that collects the samples from them, both at the very beginning of the time and longitudinally over time, as well as all their healthcare data, how much changes through their lifetime, so that that information can be used. And the UK Biobank has provided a lot of information about genetics and humans, which has been extremely helpful. It's about 20 years old uh, and, and, uh, and is continuing. Canada has a large biobank group and in their Canadian Cancer Resource uh, also has biobanks of which uh, is very, very helpful and keeps many of the activities going on in Canadian research that mimics many of the things happening in the US as well. How to molecularly get information from subjects, advancing the tracking systems, uh, managing all the clinical trials involved in the trial so that they're done commonly uh, and having uh, certain technologies that are available to help help document the material that is there. In the US, we have the National Cancer's uh, Clinical Trials Network structure. Uh, so that is really the network structure that is studying all cancer uh, and cancer research, for example, that, that where people are, people are actually going on trials, where new drugs are developed and presented. And even the NCORPS, which is our, our hospital system across the street, Corwell is part of the NCORP with the West Michigan uh, Research Consortium. And so if many people produce or are, are available to provide samples to biobanks uh, based on their clinical trial, their interactions with the clinical trials. And this is another example of the biobank systems that's available in the US. Also in the US, they started the All of Us program, which Corwell also is a, project, a part of. But this project is really about, again, similar to the UK biobank, where they're collecting up to 1 million subjects and following them through their lifetime, following them with specimens collected to really try to understand what happens to an individual, a normal individual through their time of human health. Uh, so these are very, very important biobanks to maintain. This was actually uh, maintained at, at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, we did compete for this particular biobank and we're in the last running of it, but it went to the Mayo Clinic, which was well-deserved. We, however, have our own involvement in the NIH uh, biobank systems. Uh, we are the only biospecimen core resource for the Cancer Moonshot. Uh, the Cancer Moonshot Biobank, as you've heard probably from presentations by President Biden, um, is really an effort to try and collect samples so the scientists can study various cancers uh, throughout their uh, the lifetime of those cancers. Uh, it also is to providing an opportunity for uh, subjects who enroll in those to get molecular information about their cancer, the molecular changes of their cancer type, which actually may help to inform some of the treatment ongoing while they participate in this study. So we are the only biospecimen core resource. We send kits out to the, to the locations where they are collected, and then they're sent back to us where we process them, biobank them, and send them on to the molecular characterization laboratory uh, that might be a part of that work. Another large biobank that we've been involved in is called the Clinical Proteomics Tumor Analysis Consortium. And it's called, for short, we do a lot of acronyms, CPTAC. Uh, the CPTAC program is looking at the proteins of cancers. Uh, in other words, what's mutated in a gene will usually get mutated in a protein. And they want to know how those proteins either help to establish a commonality of understanding the cancer or maybe even as a biomarker to help for new diagnostic testing in, in those cancers. Uh, so we're again the uh, we're the biospecimen core resource for that entire program, and we receive samples from all over the United States for that. We have been in the past uh, from 2010 to 2016 the GTEx uh, biospecimen core resource. This was an NIH study where they were looking at the end of life of patients over more than 1,000 individuals, where samples were collected uh, from multiple organs so that they could learn and understand the interaction uh, between the tissues themselves, cells from one to organ, uh, comparing its communications to cells in a different organ, or just about those particular transcriptomes that, that do occur. And they've learned a tremendous amount. There's a lot of publication there uh, that's been out on the web. So this is a continued source 
Uh, we moved the biobank from Van Andel to the Broad Institute, but they also maintain a lot of the epigenetics and the bioinformatics uh, activities there. And so that can still be resourced by investigators if they want to use that information, as well as all the genomic data that's been collected from there. We were also have been part of the COMPASS study, which is the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation study. And this study is uh, was started in 2011, and it's continuing up today. It's going to be finishing, but we'll probably maintain the biobank here. But it is a make great strides in the treatment uh, of, of multiple myeloma research. Again, this is not a government-funded project. It's a foundation. So it's really important to understand how foundations can really help to move in uh, research forward in their specific specific areas or diseases. And I would point out here that similar to the Tubular Sclerosis Society, which is another uh, group that we work with, uh, this is a very focused rare disease. And many of the rare diseases that occur uh, need to have biobanks more than anyone because you're not gonna come across as many subjects as you would for something like a colon cancer or lung cancer. And so they need to collect specimens from these individuals, whether it's looking at genetic information or the disease itself with the disease tissue or samples, they need that collection in order to do a large broad research study. And if you think about funding, funding happens most often where there's good questions are provided and it will help a lot of people. In many cases, rare diseases are a collection of maybe a few thousand or 10,000 people, but that's actually very small when you're thinking of the worldwide contribution of people with disease. So foundations for rare diseases are extremely important. And the TSC Alliance is one of those groups that we work with. Also recently here at the Van Andel Institute, the West Michigan Neurogenic Disease Program was funded uh, by a very generous uh, gift. And it is called the MIND program. And it is really to study the uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and so forth here at the Institute. So faculty here at the Institute can really focus on a lot of very detailed questions, ones where they may not have other funding. And in process of that, we've started a biobank for the MIND program, which collects samples from movement disorder clinics, but also is collecting some brain. So there's a brain bank component uh, to this, uh, this uh, biobank. And it's a very strategic biobank, and we're excited to be involved in that. Two other areas that we work with here at the Institute are the Stand Up to Cancer epigenetics team uh, that came across here, came here with Peter Jones and also Steve Balin, uh, super prominent uh, scientist. Peter is our scientific officer, chief scientific officer. And we have the, science, the Stand Up to Cancer or SU2C biobank. We collect samples from other institutions where clinical trials are ongoing. They come here, they're actually running through our other core laboratories for data analysis and for data management and information. Uh, also, we that, that piggybacked, it used that program uh, to develop a SPORE grant, which was a specialized program of research excellence. And SPORs require the presence of a biobank. Those are funded by the National Cancer Institute, and they really look at how they can uh, excel in a specific disease area or type of area. And that's why they're provided to scientists who have a lot of knowledge in those specific areas of disease research. So we do participate in the SPORE for, it's an epispore, an epigenetic SPORE. So how can people get involved in biobanking? Well, if you're a patient or an organization connected to clinical trials, uh, you may be asked to donate samples, blood, tissue, whatever the sample may be. Uh, to that trial. So one aspect is just review the project, talk to your physician, nurses, whoever may be presenting it to you, determine if it is a project uh, that you're interested in. You always have the option of saying no. It's not something that is involved in your standard of care. It's only to help accelerate or add new knowledge. Uh, determine what type of sample is needed, uh, how much and how often. It, sometimes there may be more than one collection of samples over time. Uh, and how that sample may be used. It's not only used in the, in the primary research, but they may be asking to use for secondary use, which means other projects that samples may be useful for, but not a, not a part of the primary question. And I would tell you that that's actually a very good thing if they have that, in my opinion, and that they have that uh, in an in a informed consent document, because it means that your sample is provided in biobanking are actually able to give more value to science downstream than just one particular use. And once all your questions are, are answered and you feel comfortable with knowing what you need to know, 
then you would be signing an informed consent form and then participating by yourself in that, in that way. But you could also participate in other ways. You could be a patient advocate. Uh, many biobanks need patient advocates. They need to know, they need to hear from the public that they're doing things the right way or that uh, the public would, is not perceiving the information correctly. Uh, this, for example, this, uh, this opportunity to talk with you today is, is helping us to maybe communicate what we do to you and hopefully maybe your questions might help us to make sure that we're doing the right things uh, for the public's point of view. And then, of course, if you're a student, um, someone who's looking to want to get into involved in biobanking, uh, usually we look for persons who have a Bachelor of Science degree, maybe in a biological field, doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, and someone who is maybe maybe interested in postdoc work, who wants to do uh, go on to graduate school, maybe from their BS. Uh, and so that that is really opportunities that we're that we think about, and whether we can provide those is based through some of the programming that we have here at the Van Andel Institute. But that's also just an area you might find. And again, biobanking isn't only at the level of human specimens. It could be in animals. Uh, it could be in in plants. Uh, fish, many, many other areas that biobanks do exist to help study the biology of those particular entities. So with that, I will say thank you and i um, really interested to talk to you about any of the questions uh, that you may have. Dr. Jewell, thank you so much. Uh, some exciting information and definitely enlightening. We have a first question that just came in and it is, is VAI or anyone else studying progressive supranuclear palsy? Yeah, so I, I would I would refer that to our neurodegenerative uh, uh, chair, um, Darren Moore, and we can certainly take those questions and pass it along. Um, that, that usually is, it, those are oftentimes involved in spectrum of diseases. So even when you're looking at something like Parkinson's, uh, you may find that there's, there's a range of spectrum of diseases of which they have to know about or make sure they're looking into as far as part of that study or be aware of how it's connected. So I know I don't know if anyone's looking at that specifically, but I would certainly uh, like to move that question to Dr. Moore if there's an opportunity uh, in the future for him to comment on that. Great. Next question. Can you speak to the differences or pros and cons between public NGO or institutional biobanks and private for profit biobanks? Yeah, I've always been part of an institutional or academic biobank. Um, I would say that uh, the, the, the profit side of biobanking is not very high, although there are some that are out there, they do exist. Uh, most of the biobanking that is uh, made available is usually through a lot of infrastructure and management cost to the institution or the program itself funded by uh, the agencies that may fund the research. Uh, and that's where a lot of times things fall short if, if it's only for a short period of time, because biobanking often is a long-term commitment, uh, but it may not be in some cases. So, uh, you know, there's, I think that the academic side personally is one that you can count on as being very, very judicious uh, and and plans on you know using your samples very appropriately. It doesn't mean that commercial groups that may be providing it from a commercial point of view is inappropriate. It's just that you need to be aware of that, and they and you really want to look into what they claim to be all of the uses of those samples, and also how much they keep your data, how much of the data about you that they keep, and how well is that protected. So those are things that uh, doesn't mean that they're necessarily bad. Some biobanks out there exist for the purposes of helping to feed the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which needs a lot of samples. And one of the challenges with academics to pharmaceuticals is that it's kind of a gateway of conflict of interest for faculty in many cases to, to provide samples or, or individuals to provide samples to pharma. Uh, so pharma does look for a lot of biobanking activities that is more, more generalized and, and has to run on a commercial concept in order to get access to the specimen. So it's kind of knowing a little bit more about how, what's the background of the funding to help you with that question. So when you think about funding um, from your perspective, what's the future of biobanking? Well, I, what I didn't say, and I should have said, is that there's probably no more important time to biobank than now. And the reasons I say that is because the omics world of science, of biomedical science, especially, and then probably many other areas of science, uh, is just huge. So 
whole genomic sequencing, uh, RNA sequencing, proteomics, metabolomics, it's all of the omic world. So they're much, much Same. larger data sets. And so what we studied 10, 15 years ago on samples may have been only one very small section or component of the biology. But these other technologies now provide a large opportunity to look at many, many pieces of data within that sample. So it's really giving you a much broader uh, perspective of what's going on in the sample and helps to define whether that sample, uh, whether there's our differences that maybe we had missed previously. So uh, biobanking, because it needs to be often batched through uh, a lot of these uh, activities, like you need to do 30, 40, 50, or 100 samples at a time, is a much, much better way to uh, approach those issues. And so I would say it's actually more important today than it ever has been in the past. Our next question is, is anyone studying chrondosarcoma? Um, we do have uh, we do have some investigators who are studying uh, sarcomas or the concepts generally. So I would leave it to them to answer specifically which areas they're studying. I never like to exclude you know the specifics of any particular disease because it may have overlapping interest to an investigator. Uh, but sarcomas, we do have investigators studying here. Uh, you know, relative to some of our clinical investigators, clinical work, um, and bone metastasis and things like our bone our bone diseases. Um, and so they're sometimes they're associated or representative in the same, some of the same pathways and features. Um, so that's of interest there. All right, so I'm curious, uh, how does biobanking support the work happening at VAI? I know it's a global um, issue, and, but is it helping the work you're doing and your team every single day? Yeah, I hope so. You know, I, I, I would say that we also, uh, so we collect, we've collected over the years from some of the local hospital areas, a series of uh, cancers uh, so that that's in our biobank is available for scientists to use. Uh, we also biobank for individual projects of investigators. Um, one who has a pancreatic studies going on, we help to work with them. Uh, we also work with others who are doing things in even uh, in, in, in care of inflammation of disease. Uh, there's a, lots of biobanking going on in the neurodegenerative areas in terms of the brain, like I said, the mind biobank. Um, and so there's, there's different groups, the SU2C, the Stand Up to Cancer group. Uh, we do a lot of biobanking for all those elements, and we're available for just general biobanking for, for individuals who want to bank through us and manage it here. That doesn't require that faculty have to take their own set of samples and bank them with us, but oftentimes there's some that do, especially if they're large. Uh, we do maintain control of the, of the animal biobank relative to what was called um, xenografts in terms of disease tissue or PDXs, patient-derived xenografts. So tissue that may have come out of a patient, a tumor that gets implanted into a nude mice so that it can actually grow, uh, can help to re recapitulate that tissue, regrow the tissue so that it's available for study. So we manage the PDX models uh, and help and work with our vivarian core uh, for help for helping scientists to get that work done. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that we do interact with investigators here at Van Andel. You know, it's exciting because I think a lot of us are listening today thinking, I want to be a part. I want to help in some way. Uh, we just had a question come in. That, How can people currently diagnosed with PSP become part of your studies? Uh, so so any, any information about the large studies, we would focus you or push you to those groups that are managing the trials or the collection of those samples. So we ourselves uh, don't make that connection to the patient public generally. Uh, we are usually working with those groups. Uh, so if it was somebody who wanted to be involved in the cancer moonshot, we would send you to the NCI group or to your uh, local hospital group that may know more about it. Uh, PSP, for example, others, we would probably push you back towards uh, those, those entities, those hallmarks, those groups that involve, uh, are involved in the management of those patients. At this point, I would like to encourage anyone who is joining us today to feel free to just go ahead and post your question in that chat area while we have Dr. Jewell with us. It's uh, awesome to have you here today. And I know a lot of us are excited to be a part of the good work you're doing. So if you do have a question, I would encourage you put it in that chat. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we also have listed some resources available. 
Dr. Jewell, as we begin to wrap up our conversation, what are some of those key things you really want us to take away from today's presentation that hopefully you're like, I'm thrilled that people have learned this. What's that thought? Yeah, I think for the public, uh, it's to understand um, how critical scientific infrastructure is important to be able to do the work. So we're not at the forefront of making the scientific discoveries, but the infrastructure to support those this, the discoveries is critical. Um, by you be realizing that when you're actually involved in a trial of some sort, uh, realize there's a lot behind what is being done there to help inform scientists and physicians on how to treat the disease and manage the disease. Uh, so, you know, we're in that background of groups that work with you, uh, but you don't really see us or hear about us. It's one of the, we're one of the silent elements of, uh, of scientific study, but I think a very integral one. And uh, so it's just important to know that there's a lot of experts, I think, around the interaction of patients with clinical trials or trying to find discoveries. Um, you could even extend it to something even more recent, and you may agree or disagree, but like the COVID pandemic, um, as I showed the clinical trials groups, one, zero, one, two, three, uh, none of the trials for vaccinations were provided without going through a phase three trial, which maybe involved thousands of patients. So there's a very systematic, clear process uh, that has to occur in order for drugs to be available. And so they're tested much longer lar or larger than you might think. Although when you think about 3000 persons, that's not millions. And uh, so you've got obviously challenges with any drug, no matter what drug it is. Um, how is it going to affect people in the long term over over time? Um, you know, and, and 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 because we have such a diverse human population, it's going to be different for some people than other. And there's just really no way of knowing all of the answers on how a particular drug may affect all people or how vaccination may affect all people. But the safety element of it and the activities of it are there and biobanking is a large part of that activity. And that's one of the things that I think that you could say we're contributing to in biobanking that is probably not understood or seen behind the scenes. We have another question. Um, do donors to the biobank ever learn what has become of their samples regarding whether it was helpful, useful? Is there some kind of connection once you make that donation? So that's a very good question, and uh, and one that I've been involved in a lot of biobanking over the years in terms of this of the um, the different national groups about biobanking, and they've always said as patient advocates, where can we get our information on how the sample we contributed helped? Uh, first off, I'd have to say for your individual sample, that would be almost impossible to do because again, if you recall. Uh, we're trying to protect your identity, protect the information about you. And so that information is not always passed on to the individual researchers. So, you know, they really don't know. They're looking at samples as a whole. And so you get aggregate data, which is very helpful. Uh, and much of the time, this aggregate data is presented, especially now more than ever, in, in uh, requirements by, if it's NIH funded, required to share the data with the, with the public, with all other scientists, for example. And that's one of the elements that helps you to understand how are these samples that are provided for this particular study? What were the results from that? These usually come out in, in scientific publications. So it may be hard to read them and understand them. Uh, but many, many opportunities there are on the website. If you go to the website for a particular study, it should talk about the results of that study and, and or if you go to the biobank, it'll tell you about what the biobank did. And I presented several biobanks uh, today, the UK biobank, uh, the Framingham study, the All of Us program. So as those develop and get mature, you'll find they're presenting a lot of data from them. The, the MMRF Compass study presents the information of what they found uh, through, that, through that study. And that is helping you to understand that. Getting to a lot of the nuances of real specific issues with being, being part of the study team, but they try and generalize that to an element that you can understand uh, in, their, in their publications or their, or their websites. Great. Another question. If we are part of a study outside of the geographic area, do you want us to connect with you, with those researchers that run that study we participate with? Uh, if you're yeah, if you're working with a study that's outside the geographical area, I would still go to the, the the ones who are in charge of the study, 
because they're going to be the individuals who help you uh, to really get connected in the way that you may want to get connected. Uh, if we know who they are, we can help you get access to them, or we may be willing to look that up for you. Um, so that's that's one thing that might be of interest for you. You could send your questions to us, and we could certainly try and find uh, how that's related. We we generally know how to do that. So um, one of the things that is really important, I think, is really kind of knowing who the, uh, the 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 principal found or the principal study group is doing the work, and also they may or may not be the one who manages the biobank. Uh, so that's why you want to go to the principal study group and try and learn from them what you can do to get be involved or have more more information about your disease or or contributions. This next question, you mentioned you bid on some biobanking opportunity at the Mayo Clinic, but lost to another provider. Are you seeing more competitive competitive opportunities lately um, from new players? And how do you remain price competitive? Um, I would say the Mayo Clinic actually was the one who uh, got the award for the for the All of Us program. And it was a, a huge award. Um, in many ways, we're thankful that we didn't get that award because it would have meant major, major changes. Um, and, and I would suggest, I would say that that's an example of where we are we were on the on the cuffs of participating with that or or competing for it, but we're really kind of in a niche that is more of the NCI study of of a thousand or two thousand uh, patients or trials that are doing that kind of work, um, and so those are areas where we're really really good at it. We're also very good at managing collections from around the country, where many many situations when you go through a clinical trial, those collections are happening at the hospital that the patient's associated with, and then later transferred to a biobank. But we're really kind of interacting with the site that's doing the collection and getting the samples here. And it's But it's for a very well-planned out uh, larger study from either the National Institutes of Health um, or from a group that's studying from there. So we have a very specific niche. I would say that we have competition for that, but the competition is not um, uh, as large as you might think, because a lot of academic biobanks don't care to get into the, the government side of biobanking, um, mainly because they're restricted on many things that they can do, uh, may, creates a little bit more uh, paperwork and challenges for them, and uh, they may not have the, uh, the shareholders there at the institutes that are interested in doing that. Uh, but for us, it provides us with uh, great expertise to do what we do, and then we can apply that expertise to our own institute, to our own investigators, and often, hopefully be able to provide the opportunity for our investigators to get involved in some of those biobanks. So when I think of the small or rare disease biobanks, many of the ones that are talking to us or have talked to us or ones that we've formed are do fit into the, the neurological setting. Um, and so those are areas that may be of interest to our faculty. Uh, also cancer is interesting and certainly epigenetics crosses all the barriers uh, for those biobanks to be effective or potentially helpful to investigators here. Scott, this uh, wraps up the question portion of it. I want to just say thank you to you and your team for the brilliant work you're doing and for keeping Van Andel Institute and West Michigan at the forefront. So thank you to you and the team. Thank you, Miranda, and happy to be a part of the session today. Thank you. Thank you. So many great insights. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jewell, once again. You know, I wanna thank each of you for taking time this afternoon to join us for this presentation. If you want to visit BAI.org to learn more about the Institute's good work, to sign up for the mailing list, uh, you can follow us on social media as well. And, you know, you can join us whether it's virtually or in person. We really wanna see you at future events. This is how we learn, we grow, and we become passionate about the work that is happening every day on the Hill. And now we have another public, public lecture series coming up that'll be on April 25th. It will feature Dr. Scott Rothbart, who will provide insights into epigenetics uh, and how it's revolutionizing what we know about health and informing new strategies for treating cancer. You can learn more about that event, how you can sign up and be a part of it all. Just go to our website and check out the public lecture series events section. I wanna thank you again for joining us today and I hope you have a fabulous day where you live.